Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Here we are by the blessings of God. We are sitting here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we have all the sisters with us over here. We're a uh, sister who are American Muslims, and they're going to talk to us today about the way they got into uh, this dress and how they are proud of this dress. It's uh, kind of uh, strange to have uh, Americans dressing this way. So we kind of interested in the way they look, uh, the way they handle this, and the difficulties they uh, pass through. What I'll do, uh, I'll uh, let Sister Shul uh, moderate the questions over here. And uh, Sister Shul herself was an American, and uh, she uh, became an American Muslim, alhamdulillah. So we'll have her to moderate this session and uh, talk to you and uh, give you a few questions over here. Would you come in, please, uh, Sister Cheryl? Assalamu alaikum to the sisters, and I'd like to welcome you all into our program. Today we're going to talk about hijab. Hijab is a word for Muslim dress. In the Quran, we're told, that's our holy book, we're told exactly what we should be wearing. I'd like to ask the sisters now what it took, what went into their decision in deciding to wear Islamic dress? Any volunteers first? Assalamu alaikum. Um, when I decided to become a Muslim, I wanted to look like a Muslim. Because, you know, Christians, that some of them wear long sleeves and long dresses too, but they you know, they look Christian, you know, so but a Muslim covers everything. And from the beginning, from day one, when I said I took jihada and I wanted to become a Muslim, I was so proud of it, I wanted to look like a Muslim. And for those who don't know, shahada is our declaration of faith. When we decide to become a Muslim, we make it known to other people. I'd like to ask Sarah Asad now, if she would go ahead and give us. When I, when I first became Muslim, I didn't know if I wanted to cover. Um, I was 15 when I became Muslim, so I was I was really young. But after I had gone to the mosque and I had been going to Islamic classes for the American Sisters for Converted Women, um, all my friends, they covered. And for me, it had more to do with the, the good sisterhood that I felt all around me than anything else. It had to do with the sisterhood. And so that's why I started covering. And that's why I continue to cover it, because it's my religion. That's what we do. Are you telling me you weren't forced to wear this clothes? Uh, certainly I wasn't forced to wear them. I, I covered just in hijab at first, and then I started to cover by wearing um, a jilbab, which is like a coat. And then uh, I've been wearing niqab. I've been covering my face for about two and a half years now. Um, when I first became Muslim, I was in Arkansas. They did not wear hijabs or jabobs. I started out wearing a crochet cap. I moved to Tulsa and I felt so out of place. All the sisters looked so beautiful in their hijabs. I wanted to cover also. It was no trouble for me and I am glad I'm covered. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I decided to wear hijab uh, because I talked about it a lot and one day I was riding home with a friend and all of a sudden we were talking about it again. I was going to discuss uh, how to do it to go to my sister's wedding. And uh, you could say I kind of, uh, well, <laughs> uh, she uh, sort of said, well, if you're, if you're not going to do it, then quit talking about it. And so therefore I said, well, you know, that's kind of well put, and I think I shall do it. And uh, it was during the second day of Ramadan I decided to uh, cover. And I feel it makes me, uh, I feel more prideful, and I feel um, I have more power. <laughs> if anyone can understand that, you know, I, I'm not afraid of anyone, so, except for Allah, <laughs> which we have to be. There are two other sisters who can answer this question for us right away. Sister Jamila. When 
I first studied about Islam, uh, in the book it said Muslim women cover a certain way. And I assumed it was like many of the Christian religions, just when they go to worship. And I found out the day I said Jahada from Mashallah, one of the pictures, uh, she told me no Muslim women they wear it all the time. And my decision to wear hijab mainly was on I wanted to be a Muslim. I didn't want to be part Muslim. I wanted to be a whole Muslim. And if it took covering properly, like Islam says in the Quran, then that's what I needed to do. It wasn't a matter of do I want to or could I. It was a matter of will I. And that had to be a decision, you know, am I going to or am I not? You know, everyone else on planet Earth doesn't matter because on Judgment Day, no one's going to matter except for Allah and what you do. My sister Latifa, if you would tell us. Assalamu alaikum. I have been Muslim since 1961. I was in Flint, Michigan, and I accepted the religion under El Haj Malik, known as Malcolm X. That's how I learned about Al Islam. And I have covered ever since because to me it's a way of life for me. And that's the reason why I do it. I only want to please Allah. I'm not about pleasing man. I had been a Muslim more than 10 years before I decided to start covering my hair and dressing in full Islamic dress, but I consider this a full Islamic dress, as you'll see that other people have taken different interpretations of the same criteria that were given in the Quran. Having taken 10 years, once I decided that I was going to do it, I still took one more year. I said on March of one year that in the March of the next year that I would start covering. And I spent that whole year weighing my options. And so I'd like to ask you, what were the things that went into your decision, pro and con? Paula? Um, I, uh, I would always think about what my family would think, and I would think about what, whether I wanted to do this certain activity at this time without hijab, because I thought there are some things I can't do without hijab, uh, or do with hijab. Uh, and then there were I just, part of, I didn't want to do it, and part of, I did want to do it, and uh, I guess it, uh, um, it was just about what my family might say, in which most of them were uh, with my decision anyway, but they still asked questions about, well, why do you do this and why do you do that? But it was mostly what my family might say and what I wanted to do in order to uh, get my life on the right track, um, as in certain activities that you couldn't do with hijab. <coughs> and Sister Barbara. I saw him like <coughs> My decision had more to do with self-image, I believe. I, when I first came into Al-Islam, I covered and it was accepted and I was in a community that where everyone covered and it was beautiful it was something I did I never even thought about but when I left that community <clears throat> I came back to Tulsa there was no Muslim community here and I I was I felt that the, the, there was no acceptance of hijab here and my self-image was just dwindled um, uh, it took a few years for me, and the final decision came with uh, my wanting a closer relationship with the law. So I'm back in hijab, and I've been back in hijab for a few years now, all the time. It's not just, you know, some time. And uh, alhamdulillah, I'm much happier, much less depressed. <laughs> Sister Samaya? Assalamu alaikum. May Allah have mercy on me. Um, I don't think my decision to wear hijab had anything to do with self-image or anything. I don't know what it had to do with. I was just introduced to Islam in a very slow and delicate way. And um, even after I was away from it, I took hijab 
uh, many years as a part of me, even without the rest of Islam. Uh, even in my kafir life of going to discos and these type places, I took hijab with me in these places, astaghfirullah. Until one day it finally dawned on me why I really wanted it and what it was really for. And alhamdulillah, everything else came with it now. Sister Denise will be next. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to say something about the meaning of the hijab. Hijab does not mean scarf or does not mean covering. Actually, it means protection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Muslim women to wear hijab in order to protect themselves from the eyes of other men other than their husbands. A lot of people outside the Islamic community does not understand what the meaning of the covering is and what it's for. I'd also like to explain that we do not wear this in our homes with our children and our husbands. A lot of times people have the misrepresentation and I've even been asked if I do I take a shower in this and I mean I'm serious you know people that are not informed about Islam I mean they're not ignorant but they're not informed about our religion and our culture do not understand what its meaning and what its reasoning is I want to explain that there is a purpose for it and it has its place and it's very logical it's not something that we've chosen to do that has no rationale we do not want men other than our husbands to look at us so we put the covering when we go outdoors or we're going to be exposed to men other than our husbands. But when we're in our homes with our families and our children, then we can take it off and just be your, you know, be yourself and wear, you know, appropriate attire for, you know, indoors. Also, I'd like to say that one thing that influenced me about wearing the hijab was my daughter's. I did not cover when I first became a Muslim, but when my oldest daughter was about four years old, she asked me one day why I didn't cover when she saw her grandmother and her aunt covering and she knew that in Islam I'm ordered to do so and of course I always had excuses of school and other activities and other reasons why I didn't put the cover and I felt that my family would not support me and you go up against a lot of these type of things in America coming from a non-Islamic culture so it was a hard decision for me, but alhamdulillah, I'm glad that I made that decision. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that decision easy for me. Inshallah, the other sisters who are Muslim and that are not covering, because there are a lot of Muslim women in this country who are afraid to cover because of the obstacles that they do come up against. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the strength to cover and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for them. Thanks for those explanations. They are indeed due. Uh, Sister Tracy. Assalamu alaikum. I've been wearing hijab for about two years. I've been a Muslim almost four. It took me some time also to begin wearing hijab, mainly because of my fears of not knowing what to expect when I began covering. And I had heard stories too, you know. But alhamdulillah, I've, I have been covering, and since then, I have a, a different respect for myself. And um, I think it's the best thing I could have done for myself. After Sister Jamila answers, I'm going to ask everyone, is the reality as bad as your fears? Did what you were most afraid of actually come true? Just one thing I wanted to say is after you become Muslim, you continue learning all your life. And I became Muslim because I believed in Islam. And I kept learning since the day I said Jihada. And I know so much more now, alhamdulillah, than I did when I first started to study. And mashallah, one thing that's very helpful are the sisters who are your friends who encourage you and educate you. My very good friends educated me, mashallah, what the Quran says about Islam and reminded me of a very important point in my finding uh, Islam and implementing it in my life is the Quran says, cover yourselves that you may be known as a Muslim. When I was searching for Islam, I wanted the community. I wanted to find 
a Muslim sister. I wouldn't have been able to find her if she didn't cover. This was something that told me she's a Muslim. She's the person I want to talk to. And the sister, mashallah, Allah directed me to was a personal answer to prayer. And I'm very thankful. And it's very important. It's part of our dawah as Muslim sisters. Let's talk about the fears now. Were the fears actually realized? Well, um, I didn't, when I became a Muslim, I started covering, and then I got scared because of my family and stuff, and I got away from some of the Muslim friends I should have stayed with, and I stopped covering. And in this time period, a lot of stuff happened to me, you know, and um, I felt scared, and I know I'm a Muslim, but I'm still, you know, scared. I know it's like putting a puzzle together, and there's a piece missing. Um, when I, I mean... It's hard to explain. Um, so the first of the Ramadan of this month is when I start covering again. I made this a goal, and I made it like I will stick with these friends and all this stuff. Um, but when I start covering again, it's still hard for me because of my family. But you have to look at it like maybe you're being the example for your family. When I go to my parents now, they're like, they don't like it because I'm covering. But I know that in Shala, I'm making a good example for them. Because like before I start covering, I saw one sister all the time in the grocery store. And she covered all the time. And this made an example. If she didn't cover, how am I going to know she's a Muslim? So, I mean, there's fears of it, real big fears. Like having to explain to your parents why, you know, and just... It's really, it's, it, you just have to look at, you know, on the day of judgment, you're going to be happy, and Allah's going to look at what you did, you know, in spite of what other people did. And the people that laughed at you, the people that did all the bad stuff, all you know is you're being a good example for them, and, you know, Allah will reward you for being an example. You know, us women covering, we have, you know, struggle when we go to the grocery store, when we have our families that are American and all this, but we have to just, you know, I just had to bite down and say, look, you know, if I'm a Muslim, I'm going to act like a Muslim. If you act like a Muslim, you have to cover and all this stuff. So you have to, it's like putting a puzzle together. You can't see the whole picture of the thing unless you do everything you're supposed to in Islam. Because Islam, it's a very easy religion because you have to follow it step by step. If you follow each step, but you skip a step in Islam, of course it's going to be hard and it's going to seem bad. But if you go by every step the woman's supposed to follow in Islam, then you're going to, this is going to be the most beautiful religion that you've ever had in your life. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sister Amina. Assalamu alaikum. alaikum Whenever I began to cover, first of all, I really didn't, anticipate any um, negative feedback from it and I guess that's good because I'm, otherwise who knows if I would have covered as soon as I did but um, then when I did become you know I was covering and I would go out and things I really I didn't experience a lot of negative um, things from people around me um, currently I go to the Tulsa Junior College, and everybody is really pretty accepting of me wearing hijab. They are curious. They do ask, but um, I don't. I've never really had anything horrible happen to me, or anyone. You know, occasionally someone will make a, a comment off, you know, a, a side remark, but I just ignore those and go on. And I've really never had any bad experience. Thank you. Sahar Jaliwala is in college now also. High school, sorry, high school. Um, and she's going to tell us what's happening in high school. Assalamu alaikum. I started covering this just this last November. And I'm, I was born a Muslim, so I've been a Muslim all my life. But I just never felt, when I became a teenager, I never felt, gosh, I, I wear modest clothing. Why should I have, why does a scarf make a difference? But then I went to this convention 
and I had decided that I wanted to wear a hijab, but I kept putting it off. I'm like, gosh, it's high school. I'll wait till college. People are more accepting in college. But I went to convention, and I found out that by being, when not wearing hijab, people kept asking me if I was Hindu. And I wasn't showing them what I really was. I was kind of not showing them I was a Muslim. I was just saying it. And when I wore hijab to school, I was expecting so much negative feedback. And so the first day I came back from that convention, I didn't wear it. And I felt really awful that the next day when I went, I went with this attitude that if anybody looks at me, dirty looks, I didn't even see it. If anybody gave me one, I did not even notice. It was just, I just went, had this thing that I'll wear it. I don't care what anybody says. And I did it. And, but people were so nice. They were so respectful. They asked me so many questions. But it wasn't bad questions. It was they wanted to learn and they were really respectful about it. You've had a change in your life. You've decided to wear a different kind of clothing. Do you ever want to go back to the way it used to be, so simple, so free, you didn't have hard decisions because you dressed like everybody else? I remember Sister Olivia telling me that she wanted to answer a question like this. Well, um, when I started covering again, and for good, inshallah, um, she asked if I ever would want to go back no, because now that I'm covering, I feel protected. When I go into the street, I get more respect. Of course you're going to get people, you know, saying things to you, but you have to just smile at them and be, you know, sh be a Muslim. Just smile and be happy. So um, I would never think to not cover again. I, I've made my decision to cover and to be a Muslim. I feel you should cover, and this is the way I'll be. I'd like to ask now, some of you are working outside the home and are not students. Have you faced any problems wearing your hijab on the job? Sister Barbara, I'd like to start with you. SubhanAllah, I've been on my present job now for about 16 years. I'm a registered nurse in a hospital, and um, everyone knows me. <laughs> So while I'm wearing hijab, um, I did have to make some explanation, but I, I started making up a dawah package to take. Everyone was so curious. And the problem, uh, a lot of times when you're going out and you're, you're faced with having to explain yourself, people really do want to be educated. And it's good to have something. So, you know, we have uh, Dawa in this community, and they have wonderful resource materials. Inshallah. Um, what is Dawa? <laughs> that is um, instructional. It's um, education for a for Islam. You are giving, um, educating the community. Um, yeah, teaching and letting people know just what Islam is. Um, and like the sis well, many of the sisters said, if you weren't hijab, they, they want to know, you know, they want to know about Islam. And it should be there. All of us should have dawah packages because people are so curious. Um, on my job, I wear hijab. Um, I work in the surgery department, so anytime outside, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, any meetings that I attend, I, I dress like I would if I was to attend something at the masjid. So it hasn't been difficult at all. Were you wearing hijab when you started this job? No, I was not. <clears throat> I was only wearing hijab when I attended Islamic functions. So um, I did get a lot of curious looks. There were a lot of people, you know, they wanted to know. and. Why are you wearing this? Uh, and I had to explain to them what it was to be a Muslim and a Muslim woman in America, inshallah. 
Thank you. Sister Tracy has had a few jobs and, and may be able to give us more experience and more outlook on this. Yes, I had a job, um, well, just last year that I was let go from because of my hijab. It wasn't specified that was the reason, but I worked for an attorney. And a lot of his clients, my, part of my job was to interview the clients. And many of them would come in and have an attitude the minute they saw me. As long as they talked to me on the phone and didn't see me, they had no problem with me. But it seemed the minute they came into the office and it was time for me to ask questions, they just did not want to even talk to me. And I know that's just the mentality of some of the people. They were not aware. They automatically, I think, because of the media and the, the problems that we have with um, bad representation of Islam through the media, I think a lot of the people were acting this way because they just didn't know what it was, what I was, who I was. And, but alhamdulillah, I have a job now in an Islamic community, so, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, Sister Latifa. Okay, the biggest questions I get, and I take all of those as being positive, is are you hot or, you know, questions like that. It's nothing to insult or embarrass me or anything like that. And I believe that we could in turn educate them because the most opportune time is when they ask you a question. It means that they want to know, they want an answer. This is how I take it. So let's try and use those instances as positive a way to educate them because we know the media does not. Let's talk about now um, the response from our spouses. Some women started covering before they were married, some after. I'd like to speak with a couple of sisters. Sister Patricia. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> well, I didn't cover at the very beginning when I became Muslim. It was about, oh, I guess, a year after I became Muslim and um, he, he didn't force me, he didn't tell me to. Actually what, um, what happened was the sisters, just being around the sisters, you wanted to start covering and I wanted to be an example for my daughter. I had her and she was like three years old so I wanted to be an example for her but my husband was real supportive, you know, but I would say that the sisters was the biggest impact so I would like to encourage the sisters that um, if you see a sister, she's become Muslim, don't, uh, if you see her not covering, don't talk bad about her. I think the best thing to do is just encourage her because this encouragement, you feel closer. You would see the sisters that they had such a peace about them that you wanted to feel that peace with them. And I feel like if they had said anything to me against me, I probably would have maybe turned the other way. But since the sisters were so nice, and my husband was supportive and when I did start wearing it that it was easy. Again, I'm hearing that you weren't forced. Would you please raise your hand if there was a lot of pressure put on you by your family to cover? I don't understand why there aren't any hands up. Um, go ahead, Sister Salima. I wasn't forced by my husband, but my family I really had a lot of problems with. Um, they didn't know, understand why I wanted be to become Muslim, why I had to cover. They didn't want me to come around if I was covered. They wanted me to eat pork, which I refused. And I really had a lot of problems. In my years, one particular sister I owe a big apology to because I tried to force her to cover. And I like to say, I'm sorry, sister. I, sh I should have let her take her time. But alhamdulillah, she did become Muslim. And she is covered. And I'm very proud of her. These are very deep decisions. A lot goes into them. I'd like to ask Sister Dathia what her family's response was. Assalamu alaikum. It wasn't so much family as far as uh, forcing me or, or being negative or it was people that I met. Um, 
it was forced on me. And then after I took Shahada and wore a hijab, I rebelled. I started hating myself. Because I thought, why should I do something that I don't want to do? I didn't know anything about it. All I knew is you're supposed to wear it. And so I, uh, I rebelled and I, I stayed away from women with hijabs until I started reading on my own and knowing who I was inside first and then I had to accept it because I didn't accept it at first. And I accept your apology. How fortunate we are to be here to witness that. <laughs> May it all be accepted. I'd like to ask our, our younger girls here, if they wear hijab in school, and if they wear it out in the community, I'm not trying to put them on the spot, but this is an age where they can actually make a choice, and I'm interested to hear which kind of a choice they're making. Safa. Um, I wear the hijab um, everywhere I go, so it's not really a problem for me. Um, sometimes people ask me questions I think are pretty stupid, like, do you have to wear that around your dad or your brothers, or do you shower with it? Do you sleep with it? You know, questions like that. What do you say to them? I say no. <laughs> and I say, where did you get that idea? And they, I don't know, they just, they don't answer then. They say, I just wanted to know. So. What kind of a response do you get out in the community when you wear it out outside? Like in school or like in the public? Like school and then outside school. Okay, in school, like, there are a few people, like in every school, that, you know, they'll bother you about it. Um, I don't have that many problems. I thought that when I started wearing the hijab, um, my friends would hate me. Um, I wouldn't make any friends, but now I have more friends than I thought I would make, and they're really interested, I found. They're really interested in finding out why I wear it. And when you go to the grocery store and the library and out for other kinds of activities, what kind of response do you get from the community? People will look at you, you know, like, we'll look at you, like, you know, give you a look. Um, I just kind of ignore it. Or I'll smile at them, make them feel embarrassed, you know, for <laughs> doing that to me. You're very patient. <laughs> My God help you. Okay, let's ask Sister Khalila. Khalila, is that right? Do you wear your hijab in school? Yes. And how about out in the community? Yeah, I wear my hijab everywhere except at home. How do people respond to that when you go out? Outside, mm -hmm. they'll like ask you if you're a nun or something. Are you a nun? And no. What do you say? No. No fool? Or no, I'm not? Or no, no I'm sir? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. What would you like them to know? If you could have said anything and known that they wouldn't take it the wrong way, what would you have liked to have said to them? I don't know. Are you glad that they at least cared enough to ask you? Or would you yes. rather they didn't ask at all? I'd rather them ask me. You'd rather that they asked you? Uh -huh. Okay. Why don't you give the microphone to your friend next door? Go ahead, Dasida. Wa alaikum salam. Do you wear hijab in school? Yes. How does it feel to wear it in school? I'm fine because I go to Islamic school. You go to an Islamic school. Does that make it easier? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you have to wear it? No. If you didn't wear it there, what would happen? I don't know. You don't sound very worried about it. No. No. Now, when you leave the school, you're out of the Islamic environment. How do you feel when you go to the school, to the library or the grocery store, or a play outside in the neighborhood? Well, I wonder if people ask me strange questions, <laughs> like if I'm bald-headed or something. <laughs> and how do you respond? I just say, no, I'm not bald, or I'm not a nun, or anything like that. I'd like the answer that Sister Samaya had for us earlier. She could tell us how she used to respond and how she responds now to those kinds of questions. Well, Cheryl, you mentioned before about the thing about fear, uh, about covering and being a Muslim. 
And when I first became a Muslim, I didn't care about what people thought about how I dressed because it was my decision, my choice. So if somebody passed by and called me raghead or asked me what was my problem, I stuck for a lie. I gave them a finger or cussed them out or act really stupid with them. And I had times when people wanted to turn around and, and put up their dukes with me. <laughs> so I, I, as I learned and became more educated, alhamdulillah, God gave me wisdom how to treat these kind of people. Now I, I'm very kind with them. If they ask me uh, why I wear hijab or they called me raghead, I say, God bless you too, you know. So alhamdulillah, now I get a good response. <laughs> So God bless you too. They don't get aggravated with you so no, much and it seems they, to diffuse they feel the situation. Shy. Then they feel shy. Mm. Thank God for those kinds of things. Brother Hammond, I need to ask at this point, did you want us to do both segments now? Okay. Let's go into the other part of the program then where we talk about um, what it took to convert. Okay. I'd like to ask the sisters at this time, what kinds of things went through their minds when they considered coming to Islam? And perhaps who the important people were? And what was the final decision? What brought them over the edge? Once they'd been exposed to it, what was the final thing that made it the religion for them? Any volunteers? Sister Salima. Excuse me. My decision was I grew up as a Christian. And in the Bible it says that a woman should be covered. If her head it's not covered when she go out in public that it should be shaved. And I always grew up asking questions in church. Why come the women doesn't cover? And there were so many things in the Bible that the people didn't live up to. And I would smell alcohol on the minister's breath. And I said, I don't want to follow anyone like that. So when I met my husband now, he started teaching Islam to me. One day I just decided to cover and pray with him. This was before we was married. And he was so proud that I'd done that. It made me feel good. So I started going to Masjid with him and meeting other sisters. They seemed so nice and they lived by their book. And I liked that. And I wanted to be a part of that. And Alhamdulillah, I feel like I am. Who would like to tell us what Alhamdulillah is? We've said it all day. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. All praise and thanks. Yeah, all praise and thanks be to Allah. All praise and thanks be to Allah. We keep saying it over and over and over. You've heard us so many times, and we should have told you before now. But now you know, Alhamdulillah, we're always thankful for what we have from our Lord. Sister Patricia, would you tell us what it took to bring you to Islam? Okay. Well, I had been married to my husband for about three years or four. And uh, my daughter, she was um, three years old, and she had, um, was going to the masjid to take uh, Arabic lessons and to memorize Quran. So um, after my daughter was going there, I told my husband, well, I want to go meet her teachers. I want to see where she's going. I want to see, be a part of that. And uh, you know, your first daughter, you want to make sure she's safe and everything. So I went there. And uh, just out of respect for the masjid, I put a scarf on and like a, a raincoat, just a jacket. And I went in and I met the sister and she just, when I seen her face, just like it was light and sweet and, you know, you just felt so, you know, loved by her. She, she hugged me and everything. You don't, you don't find that, you know, in America that much anymore. You don't hug each other. And when she did that, that just softened my heart, I think, towards the religion. And um, I just wanted to start learning more about it. Even before this, when my husband was fasting, I would fast with him just, you know, because he was doing it. And I said, well, in Christianity, it's good to fast too. So I said, well, I wanted to fast, so I would fast with him. And, but actually, just going to the masjid and being around the sisters uh, had, I think, helped me the most. What was it that finally had you take shahada, take the declaration of the faith? Well, I had st I started reading the Quran, the Holy Quran, and I had um, they had given me books about to study about Islam, and I w also wanted my family at that time 
Um, I wanted my family to be one religion. I thought this two religion, it's not really good. And I said, I really believed this way anyway. I always believed in one God because when I was a little girl, I remember having these questions. I would ask him, well, who do we pray to? We, there's Jesus and there's God, so is this the same? And it seemed like no one ever had really a good answer for me. And so really it just, just all came in place. It just, oh, well, this makes sense to me now. I just, so I felt like I believed this way anyway. You know, so it wasn't really that hard to go, to go on in to, I, I think, just uh, feeling the peace of the sisters. So it wasn't a change in lifestyle. It was a change in lifestyle rather than a change in belief for you. Right, right, I would say so. Even though I did love Jesus, you know, peace be upon him, and I and still, still do. I feel that probably if the religions hadn't, you know, they made me f know that Jesus, you know, we had to believe in Jesus, and we had to love Jesus, peace be upon him. So I felt that, you know, it wasn't being disrespectful or anything. It's just putting it in the right place. Oh, it makes sense. He is, he isn't the son of God. You know, so now I know I'm to pray to God. I'm not to pray to Jesus, peace be upon him. Even though he did do all the miracles and everything, he wasn't God. So it just made it easy for me. You know, it just kind of fell in place. That's the answer to the questions I was asking all those years. When all fell into place, yeah. then you took shahada. <laughs> Sister Jamila. Same question. What did it take to bring you to Islam? Well... I guess I'd have to start back like third grade. I remember once going up to the minister in our church. Uh, my father, he's an ordained minister. And when we moved, he started working as a chaplain, which is a minister to the hospital. And so we started attending another minister's church. And he gave a sermon on the Trinity. And I thought, oh, OK. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. But something doesn't make sense. I mean, how can you be the Father? How can you be the Son? How can you be this divine inspiration, all one and still be separate? How can you be divine and not divine? How can you be infallible and fallible? They'd, you cannot be both. You're either one or the other. And I remember I came up after the sermon and I asked the minister, because my father and the minister and another minister, they were talking, and I said, can I ask a question? Of course, they're very nice. You know, yeah, ask your question. And I said, I don't understand how all three of these can be one. It doesn't make sense. And he said, child, you don't understand because you don't have enough faith. And believe me, more than anything I wanted was to be God's good little girl, <laughs> you know. And, and that really hurt to hear that. And so I kind of got quiet and I became more of an observer than uh, an asker. You know, I just thought, well, I'm going to make decisions just for me. I'm not going to ask anybody about it. And as I grew up, uh, I didn't know anything about Islam. I mean, if you had asked me before I entered college, what is Islam, I would have think, oh, it's one of those heathen the religions, and I think they worship idols, and, you know, I was not educated on what this was. And I figured it might be a cult, because there's all these Islamic terrorists you hear about on the news, and, you know, they don't explain there's a difference between the religion of Islam and people who say they are Muslim. And, you know, what Islam really says, Prophet Muhammad, he hated violence. And I don't understand why all the violence. But anyways, uh, and so I, I got into college, and I, it, it became so on the news politically, Islamic terrorists, Islamic this, that. I want to understand why these people were acting like this. I want to understand what they believed. And if I could help straighten out their thinking a little bit, you know? And so I didn't want to tell anyone because I didn't want to get verbally slapped in the face again, you know? So I thought, I'm going to study this on my own. I'm just going to ask people questions. And anyone who I thought was a Muslim, I would ask questions. And I'm telling you, most of them didn't think I was serious, you know? I mean, uh, I remember opening the Mary Mob 
and it, it's a, a book, like an annual. It's got all the students' pictures and names. And I was looking for anyone who might be a Muslim. And, uh, and you know, the names, you can kind of tell if it's an Islamic name or not. And so I would see that, and I think, okay, I need to remember this face. And when I go on the campus, I'm going to look for this person, and I'm going to ask them about Islam. And you get one or two responses. Either they're so pious, they won't talk to you, because, you know, you're, you're a woman. Or, or they don't want to talk about Islam. They just want to ask you out. <laughs> and I didn't want to go out. You know, I wanted to find Islam. And so I decided, you know, that, you know, I would just, maybe I shouldn't go after this. And then I took a class at the university called Comparative Religions. And, wallahi, with all my heart, I wish my teacher would be a Muslim. Um, this professor had worked overseas for four years in Saudi Arabia and had very deep respect for Muslims because he met some real ones. And he made this very clear in his lecture. He told me what Islam really was. And this is what planted the seed in my heart. It was not a Muslim. It was a non-Muslim an old man, a, a, a Christian, subhanAllah, who really first taught me what Islam was. And, you know, he told us what the pillars of Islam were. He told us if he was a young man, he would be a Muslim. I thought, there's something here. I'm at a Christian university, and he's in front of 200 children. And, well, not children, but, you know, adults. And in comparison, we're children. But anyways, <laughs> I thought, boy, that takes a lot. You know, I thought, boy, if the school board had heard him say that, he'd be fired. But anyways, so... Probably. <laughs> and then the next day, we saw a film on pilgrims going to Hajj. I thought it was beautiful. Not only is Islam very personal to you, but it's also a very community religion. And I thought... This is complete. It's not like this religion, it's, one, it's only for the person. It's only your personal religion. Everyone has their own religion and they say we're all the same. It's not like that. It's not nobody has a personal religion in everybody's community. It's both. I thought, this is beautiful. I have to learn more about this. I had given up looking before and asking, but I thought, I have to learn more. I thought, I don't want to ask any Muslims. I don't want to hunt anyone down because it's a bad experience. I don't want to talk to anyone. And so I th I'm going to learn this on my own. I didn't want to tell any of my religious directors from the university uh, or pastors or anyone because I figured, well, maybe they'll lie to me. I want to hear some truth here. I didn't want to talk to any Muslims because, it, you know, the, my confrontation was, you know, they won't talk to me or they want to date you or... Or, you know, I didn't want somebody who was very charismatic to persuade me to believe something, you know, that maybe I shouldn't be believing. I wanted this to be my own objective decision and understanding. And so I went and got some books from our library and what they had on Islam. And they had three. <laughs> I couldn't believe they only had three under Islam. University Library. University Library. Two of them had been donated by Muslims. One was the Holy Quran, and one was the religion of Islam. And the other one, the school, you can tell inside if it's donated or not, because it's got the little paper. And the other one had been bought by the school. It was a book for Christian missionaries going to Muslim countries. And so I decided, I want to know what the real Islam is what it is they really believe. So I figured this is their holy book. And I know reading the Bible, you've got to have somebody who has a deeper understanding of history, etc., to help you understand more of what it is. So I figured that's probably not the first book I should jump into. I didn't want to be lied to, so I didn't want to jump into the one for missionaries going overseas because I wasn't sure if they were telling the truth. I figured that the book written by a Muslim about Islam would be telling me the truth that I could understand. So I read that one first. Then I read the Quran and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Every single chapter began with the most respect. I wished they had had this in the Bible. In the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. I thought, 
This is the least we can do to give him respect because he's done everything for us. He loves us so much. And then I read the third one and all the lies that they told about Islam. And I was so glad I didn't read that one first. And after that, and what's interesting is I had a best friend. And every time, and this is the only person I could really be confidant with. And uh, because I didn't trust anyone else to respect my opinion and to not try to persuade me to believe a certain way. So I used to tell her everything I would learn about Islam in the books. It was very interesting to me and it, it was very exciting every time I learned something that made sense. This makes sense. I'll go tell Angela. This makes sense. I'll go tell Angela. And she was, yeah. And she, she started reading with me. And then she had to leave because her uh, grandfather died. And to help take care of her grandmother, mashallah, she's such a sweet girl, uh, she left the university to take care of her. And I offered her one of the books because I bought them from the library. <laughs> I didn't want to give them back. And so uh, she said she wanted the Quran. And so I kept the religion of Islam. We kept reading. Well, we lost touch because she, her grandmother lived a ways away. And we lost touch and we, I kept reading. And then uh, I got to the point where I really wanted to be a Muslim. There was just one difficulty because it's so ingrained in you that Jesus is God. I was having a very difficult time with this. And I thought, well, I don't want to ask a Christian because they're going to tell me something I already know. My father's a minister. My grandparents are missionaries. Believe me, I think I've been taught. And, and I didn't want to ask a Muslim because I didn't want to be charismatically persuaded to believe a certain way, you know, because, you know, I like to agree with everyone. I wanted my own decision, you know. And so I thought, well, hmm, I need to read something, but I don't know where to go. And so I decided I wanted to talk to a Muslim woman because they're going to be straight with me, you know. They're not going to play games with me or try to run away from me, you know. They're going to really be direct. And I thought, well, how am I going to find them? And I remembered in the religion of Islam, it said that Muslim women cover. I still thought it was only when they prayed, but I also thought that I was under the impression that w women from Muslim countries, you know, pray a lot, so they cover all the time, you know. <laughs> you know so I figured, well, I'm going to look for someone who who wears like this, and I looked, and I remembered that I had seen one on my campus. I thought, she must be a Muslim. She's dressing exactly like it says here. And so I went and I waited for her, and she didn't have class that day. I was so disappointed. And I was so disappointed, and I was on my, I knew I had to go to the bank that day, and I didn't have a car, so I was walking. And, um, uh, I was discouraged, and in my heart, I said a prayer, not out loud. I, I, I said, God, I believe that you are Allah, and I want to make this change in my life, but at this point I have to get over, if you are God, if Islam is right, which I do believe, then please, I need to speak to a Muslim woman today. I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't study. I need to know. I need to meet this person. I need to have this rope to guide me. And subhanAllah, no sooner was my prayer over than it was answered. Uh, somebody I didn't know from the dorm stopped, backed up against traffic, asked me if I needed a ride. I said, yeah, she took me to the, to the bank. And I came in and subhanAllah, there she was the sister I had been looking for. I would have missed her if I had to walk the whole way. And this person I didn't know asked me if I needed a ride. Anyways, and so I asked her, may what Allah reward her. What was the question? <laughs> what brought you to Islam? What um, was the one thing holding you back? What? What was the one thing holding you back from taking The one time? thing holding me back was having been ingrained that Jesus was God. And subhanAllah, the thing that brought me into Islam was answers to prayer. And women who were brave enough to cover in public. 
if she hadn't covered in public, inshallah, Allahu Alam, Allah would have sent someone else to get that reward, to guide me to Islam, to, to where the community was, to the information I needed to go over that bridge that would cement in my heart that I'm going to be Muslim until the day I die, you know. And, uh, so you started out with uh, thoughts in third grade. <laughs> thoughts in third in grade. In a non-Muslim environment. <laughs> non-Muslim. <laughs> all the way through high school. You had it with you. Yeah. Into college. The real search begins. And it was sparked by a non-Muslim who had met real Muslims and had a so deep respect for So real Muslims can bring other people to Islam. You mean that Islam wasn't all spread by the sword? Oh, no, no. You at weren't all. forced. <laughs> No, it wasn't the terrorists. <laughs> it, was, it was the real Muslims who had really done, just living their n normal daily life was the excellent example that impressed my professor who gave me the correct perspective of what Islam really was. Thank you, Sister Jamila. Sister Farah. Well, like I said before, I became Muslim when I was 15. And I was just a regular high school girl I did some modeling and you know I was really liberated and <laughs> I never thought that I'd be wearing a veil <laughs> when I was 21 and and in this kind of life I never dreamed anything of the sort and <clears throat> I was completely an atheist my family they're all devout Catholics except for my mom and my mother she she was uh, her master's was in theology so she was kind of a searcher so I was allowed to read about other religions and I and I did so but I didn't like any of them. Any, anything that I saw of them, it just seemed very superficial. No one really practiced it. And, it, and it, in the end, it wasn't important anyway because we were on our own. That's how I felt. But I did really believe in destiny. I, I strongly believe that everything happened for a purpose. So I'm in high school, and you know I'm an average 14-year-old girl. It was my freshman year. And I meet um, a guy who's, who was a senior there. And he was 19, 18 at the time, and he was Muslim, but he didn't practice. His family had stopped practicing, and, and he, he was searching for what he was going to do after high school. His name was Muhammad, you know, so here's this guy walking around with his name, Muhammad. You know, it's, it's a banner, it's a badge of being Muslim, and he didn't practice. He was just your regular guy. And we were friends, and, and we became closer, and... As time went on, and his search is going on, what is he going to do after he finishes high school, um, he started asking himself if he was going to start practicing. And he went on his own to the mosque and started reading the Quran. And, I, and then, then he got strange, as far as I was concerned. You know, he, start, he was in the hallways all the time reading the Quran and you know, learning Arabic, and he wouldn't talk to me that much anymore. And he was always looking down when he was in the hallways, just, you know, a little frown on his face, you know, always thinking, always thinking. So, um, you know, and he's telling me these things, you know, women, they're, they're, they're gems, and they're to be respected, and, and they should cover their, their, their glory, and only expose it to who they choose to expose it. And, you know, just all kinds of things that just didn't make any sense to me. But he keeps reading this Quran, and this Quran, you know, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's that he's reading? This green book that he keeps with him all the time. Most of the, the copies in English, they're in, they're in a green cover. So he finally convinces me that, you know, if I just read this, it would, it would be interesting to me. And I read it, and I keep reading it, and the more I read it, the more it makes sense, and the more angry I get. Because the way I saw it was that, I didn't want to do this. I, th this was not something I wanted to do, but my mother had always taught me to follow my heart and to follow what I thought was right. And the more I read, the more I saw that it was the right way to live, that it was a pure way of life, a true way of life, and a whole way of life. And I think that's something that you'll hear from all of the sisters. We all see that it's a whole way of life. It's something that gives us direction in every part of our life, not just our dress, not just on our marriages, not in the way we pray, in everything, in the, what we eat, how we sleep, everything. So I leave and I go to Canada for about two months and I take the Quran with me and I had a time where I was away from Muhammad, I was away from everyone, my mother, everyone, just um, visiting 
some family friends and I stayed up in my room most of the time and read this book. And by the time I came back, I was 14 and a half, I decided that this is what I wanted to do. But I still hadn't met any Muslim women. So when I got back, I was then a sophomore in high school and 15 years old. Uh, I asked him to put me in touch with some Muslim women that I wanted to talk with them. And I talked to them maybe three times. I went to, the, to their apartment. And the third time, I talked to a, uh, a woman from Oman. And she said, so what are you going to do? Are you going to become Muslim or not? <laughs> she was really blunt. And I did. I became Muslim. It took that push, that, that, you know, that bluntness, that frankness, for me to actually accept Islam. As to what made me accept it, it was the miracles that are written in the Quran. In the 24th surah, it's called, uh, which is a chapter, like a chapter, it's called Surah Nur, and Nur means light. It talks about that everything is made from water. And of course, you know, the scientists, they say that now, you know, and there's an, another miracle in the Quran that, you know, the world was one piece and it, and it was split up, that God split it into many pieces. Things like this, you know, I was, I was a very logical person. I wanted proof that God was God. If, you know, if God was truly God, then they should have known this a long time ago. That was my feeling, you know, and, and creationists and, and people who would read Genesis, they'd say, no, oh, none of this ever happened. And it just didn't make any sense to me. And when I read that everything was created from water, it just blew my mind away. And I cried and cried and cried. And when I stopped crying, I said, look, you know, <laughs> I'm either going to do this or I'm not going to do this. But if I don't convert now, I'll never respect myself. So I converted, and the rest is kind of history. So there was uh, some consideration to logic in your decision. Uh, everything, everything to do with my decision had to do with logic. Nothing, I didn't let my heart enter into it until I had already made the decision to convert. Because I, I wanted to know, how, what was my family going to do? All, like I said before, all my family, they were devout Catholics. And that doesn't mean that they didn't accept me, but they, you know, were very strict in their faith. So I wanted to know, were they going to accept me? Were my friends going to accept me? Like I said, I did some modeling. Of course, I wasn't going to be able to do that anymore. It was just going to change my whole life. And I thought every uh, facet out before I, was, before I actually took that step to make that decision. I wanted to know if I thought I'd be able to do it. But then when I read those last few verses, there was no choice anymore. It was out of my hands. And I had to surrender. And then I was at peace with myself which is what Islam means, a surrender or, or having a peace with God, a submission to God. And then once I did finally admit that yes, there is a God, then it was complete relief because I knew I wasn't God <laughs> and I didn't have to rule my own life and I didn't have to be completely in control because obviously I wasn't. It was something that was guiding me from my, my conception. So that's how I became Muslim. For a Muslim, we all know, but perhaps our audience doesn't know, that probably the two best things about our religion is one, that we get to glorify God and get to serve Him, and the other is that we get a chance to earn our way into heaven with our good deeds and our good intentions and our, our prayers. But after those two or three things, what are the best things about your conversion to Islam? What makes it, what keeps you back and staying in the religion when it would be so easy to walk away? Paradise and keeping away from hellfire. Well, um, for me to stay in this religion is because I know it's the right religion. I have no doubts about that. And I know each day I'm living for something so great. The best thing, you can't even imagine what is going to be in the hereafter. So I know each deed I do just to be good and you're going to have the best thing. You can't ever imagine what it's going to be like in the hereafter. <laughs> Sadia, you were born into a Muslim family, but what keeps you a Muslim? You could refuse. There's no compulsion in the religion according to the Quran. Everything is so simple and clear that there is no other way because everything is straightforward in this religion. There are no ands or buts. Everything is just simple, clear, and that it is said in the Quran and in the Hadith that 
On the day of judgment, we will be judged for our deeds and to see whether we will go into hell or heaven. And our deeds are basically what is said in the Quran, and the Quran is our way of life. And so it's simple, and there's no facade or anything. It's simple, clear. Are you saying, though, that you can't question? Are you allowed to question in Islam? Yes. That is the way we learn. We have to be um, curious about it. If there's nothing, if something's not clear, you read the Quran, the Hadith, you ask your elders, you ask um, knowledgeable people. There's many ways you can find out your questions. Sahir, you were also born into a Muslim family. What keeps you in the religion? Um, what keeps me is the fact that um, I've always I've grown up, I'm, I go to American high school, there's many, many Christians around there, and you sit there and listen to them talk, and you think about, they're always trying to find themselves, who they are. And it seems like I've never gone through that stage of life. It's like being a Muslim, I knew what to do. It was so clear, and I hadn't, ha I did question, I'm here thinking, is this the right religion? It was so easy to answer that question. Yes, this is it. I mean, there's no problems is simply there and then we do we have youth interfaith and everything and you sit there and talk to these people and you tell ask us about youth interfaith what is that it's it's where the three religions who believe in one god get together jews christians and muslims and we just it was it isn't a debate it's just to learn about so we can get along better in the world together and we ask them questions about their religion while they ask us questions about our religion and you ask them and it's, they're unable to answer it sometimes because they're not sure themselves. And you can't tell anybody about your religion unless you're sure. And we've always, seems uh, with them, we've always had an easier time answering because we know. I mean, we didn't have to sit there and question. It was just simply clearly stated in the Quran what it is. Thank you, Sahib. Sister Zainab, what keeps you in the religion? What is the best part or keeps you strong in your faith? I guess thinking about the Day of Judgment, because <laughs> I know there's so many things, especially in this country, that you could do, but to be, um, to drift away from the religion, I would never want that to ever happen. God forbid. It seems to me you have a very strong support group, and you've chosen your friends carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> And you've chosen your work carefully. Yes, alhamdulillah, I have a wonderful job in an Islamic school. And everything, all the sisters around me, they, they give me support and everything. But it just, I could never trade it for anything. I'd like to have one more answer to the same question. What is it that keeps you in, this, in the religion? Life is not always easy. And so we have to have something that gets us through, but sometimes what we're depending on to get us through it doesn't happen. Um, and I'd like to talk with somebody who's not always had it easy like the rest of us, hasn't always had it easy, and, and what's gotten her through it? Well, the comprehensiveness of Islam is what keeps me in Islam. Islam guides all of us in our daily lives in what we should do with our husbands, our children, how we should act in our private lives. The comprehensiveness of Islam makes you feel secure and it has logical boundaries that guide you and lead you that you, f you don't feel that you're not sure of what you're doing. Also the, the covering also helps me feel secure in that when I'm speaking with men other than my husband's outside of my home in the stores or in places where I must speak with men when it's not possible to speak with a woman. I feel that they are looking at me as a person and not a sexual object. They are looking at me for me as a person with a mind and an education. They look at me for who I am and not for what I could be to them or, you know, in, in the way that I see in the workplace in this country, a lot of women are demeaned by their employers because they are made to feel that they must surrender to sexual harassment or they will lose their jobs and I feel that you know Islam shows women and instills in them 
the power to know that they are strong within themselves of who they are and they do not have to put up with these kind of things in order to live or you know Islam protects the woman women are encouraged to stay at home with their children and raise them but it is allowed that women can work outside the home if their husbands do not have a problem with this however they must work in jobs that are within the guidelines of Islam of course you know jobs that a lot of young girls today feel that they are forced to take because of monetary situations you know are demeaning which Muslim women are not put in that position we're not forced to be strippers or pose in magazines or or do these kinds of things Islam and our community protects us from that and that's what I feel that I want for my children for my daughters and for my son and his wife and their children and I feel that that's what keeps me in in staying with Islam that nothing that I found out there can compete with that I'm seeing a lot of nods of heads here on your response. One more question has been suggested to me, and, and it, to prepare you for it, I have to tell you that one of the things that I enjoy about Islam is the idea of balance, that in our lives we do have balance. And one of the kinds of balance is in seriousness and in levity, that we do enjoy a sense of humor, that life is not always so terribly serious as the way you may see it on TV. Um, and the question is posed to you, what kinds of funny things have happened in response to your dress? When you go out, you, I now I see some cracks of smiles. Some things you might not want to relate, but we would ask you, you know, to tone it down a little bit and, and, and relate it if you would dare. Go ahead, Sister Paula. I was driving home, I was driving home one day from Juma, and uh, my husband... Juma is? Juma is um, our Friday prayer. It's kind of like Sunday to the Christian what uh, Friday is to the Muslim. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> and um, my husband commented, he said, look, those two women are breaking their necks looking at you. I said, are you sure they're not looking at you? And he said, no, I think they're looking at you. So we just chuckled about that, and it's just really funny sometimes. I think Sister Amina was nodding her head. No, actually, Sarah has a funny story. Okay. We'll go right down the line. Go ahead, Sarah. Wow. I don't want to tell this story. <laughs> she wants me to. So. Your mother-in-law is here. She'll hear everything. Don't worry. <laughs> she knows. Um, when I was pregnant with my son, I was going to Friday prayer also, and I, I slipped going to my car. I slipped falling on the ice. Is this the story you want? <laughs> I slipped falling on the ice, and I slid halfway under my car. I was six months pregnant. My husband couldn't find me. He's kind of short. And he was on the other side of the car, and he's, he's looking, you know, on the, over the, the roof of the car. You know, where are you? Sarah, where are you? And everybody's looking, you know. Everybody's looking. And, you know, as he picks me up, he finally figures out that I'm underneath the car, and he comes and slides me back under. And as I pick myself up, you know, people were looking. But I swear to you, no one laughed. <laughs> no one laughed. And the, all of the people, both Muslim and, and non-Muslim, because it, we were in front of the mosque, like I said, um, they just kept walking like it hadn't happened. And, and I know they saw me because they were looking when I was under the car. So, yeah. <laughs> Sister Barbara, you do have something to relate. <laughs> well, there is something interesting that my other daughter went through. And I... I you say other daughter? That, Do you have a daughter that, in this room? That, well, I have a daughter-in-law here, uh, Sara, and, and my birth daughter, Zahida, used to complain all the time when we went out shopping. Those people are just staring at me. I just wish they'd leave me alone and let me shop in peace. And uh, this one particular day, a woman really followed her around, <coughs> staring. And I said, Zahida, everybody that looks at you is not wanting to harm you, you know. They're, they're not looking to, uh, for negative reasons. Finally, the woman came over and she said, you are so beautiful. You're dressed so beautiful. I just love the way you dress. I love your cover. And I thought that was, I think that's the last time I heard Zahida complaining about people. Staring at her. Inshallah. Sister Jafia. I was at the uh, grocery store, Price Mart, 
and I was using the ATM trans fund. And a man came up to me, he, I guess because I'm at it, and he's wanting to rush to get to it, and um, he's standing there saying, I wish you'd just go back to your country. I just wish you would just leave, and I don't know where you come from. So I moved away and said, here, you can use the trans fund. He didn't know how to react. He just, here he is angry, and he's, and then when he's, he looks at me, and he, thank you. He just walks away. Um, I think my most funny experience was we was in a, sh a shelter for the homeless one year and as we walked in we went by the, what they call the smoking room and everybody turned and started staring and I was in front of my husband he always made me walk in front of him when in a strange place and all of a sudden I heard him turn around and say yeah she's covered and everybody froze you know and I turned around and said what's going on he said, oh, everybody just staring at you. I just let you know, let them know you was covered and you was pretty. <laughs> and so finally this girl said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stare. She said, but i never seen a Muslim woman up close. She said, you're really pretty. She said, all I've ever seen was Muslim on TV fighting. I thought they was mean. She said, but you explain why. Y'all very nice. And I just kind of laughed and went on. Thank you. <laughs> Sister Olivia. When I first became a Muslim, I was living with uh, four Malaysian girls, and um, one day they just want to go shopping at the mall, so I went with them to the mall, and there's a lady, and she had four little boys with her, and it was me and four other girls covered, and we're shopping, and we heard him behind us say, Mommy, Mommy, look, you know, it's the Ninja Turtles' mother, <laughs> you know? So I heard him, and this is the first time I w went out in the public covered besides going to the mosque. So already I'm kind of tense about going out, you know, in the public and stuff. And one of the Malaysian girls, she turned around and she said, no, we're not the Ninja Turtles, Mom. And so the mother, she, because of her children, you know, saying this about us, she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And it caused the mother to start asking us questions about Islam. And so... I started, you know, telling what I knew about Islam because the Malaysian girls, they can't speak that well. And I was helping them out. And, I mean, so sometimes if, you know, they make fun of you, it's not in a bad way because they don't know. And they see these people. They automatically think you're from a different country. And, you know, there is American Muslims. But... More and more. More and more and more. <laughs> Just if the sisters... This is how, I mean, this is how they become Muslims if people don't know because of the cover... You present yourself for what you are. So, you know, just by the, I don't, I've never saw this lady again, but, you know, maybe in a year, just like other sisters that have become Muslim, maybe in a year she's going to come to the mosque, you know, just because her kid's saying this. It gave, it gave her an opportunity to ask questions about Islam. And that's where it starts. Sister Jamila has a story to share with us. Speaking of children, we have to remember that they tend to be very, innocent and their few short years on the earth give them only their perspective and what they've been exposed to. Like I remember a child came up to me in October and thought I was dressed for Halloween. In November they thought I was dressed like the pilgrims, you know, like the Puritans. You know, they're very conservative and pious people, mashallah. One of the stories that happened to me that, I don't know, kind of made me scratch my head was, uh, being, you know, white American, uh, you, you don't run into very much prejudice. Um, I was driving down the road, like within the first week of being Muslim, and uh, I heard, and I wasn't really hearing it because I've never really heard it before, and I heard somebody saying, go home. And I thought, Oh, that poor person, who are they saying that to? <laughs> you know? And I looked around, and there was no one else but me and those guys who were saying that. And I said, are you talking to me? You know, I was so shocked. You know, they just assumed I wasn't American because I covered. And they said, yeah, we're talking to you. Go home. I said, well, shoot, if I have to go home, then we all have to go home because my ancestors came over on the Mayflower. And the only person who has a right to be here are the American Indians. And they were so shocked. Guy, you know, a Mayflower Muslim, you know. 
<laughs> we'll start a new trend. We're going to do um, a couple more questions here. One is, I'd like to ask Sadia, who made the decision to start wearing hijab rather recently, what the response was for her, from her family. They are Muslims, but she did not wear a hijab. She did not cover her hair until very recently. Well, when I started doing hijab, I didn't tell my family. Uh, the way it started was, uh, I, I, it was my goal to do hijab when I started college. And so on my first day of college, I, I was contemplating. I didn't, do, I didn't take the hijab with me. But on the second day, mashallah, I saw so many <laughs> Muslim ladies like Sarah. And I was like, no, I have to, no matter what. So what I did was I took my scarf in the car. And you didn't put it on in the house no. when you left so that no. your parents could see you? No, because okay. in my family, they, my p mother and ladies do hijab, but not full time. It's just whenever they're in the community. And so f for me to do it outside of the home and outside the Muslim community, it would be a little awkward. And I wasn't ready to have comments from my brother and my uncle because they're very, um, uh, they weren't ready to accept it. So I just put it in the car and went to school. And I did that for a while <laughs> until one day I forgot to put it off in the car and I came home with it on. And my mom was like, oh my God, you have a scarf on it. I'm like, yeah, I started doing it at the beginning of this year. She's like, I'm so proud of you. I, I am so proud of you. And so and she's like, you are so courageous and everything. I'm like, oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> and so, but after that, I've been doing it now from the home. And I, can, I take it off at home, so. It's really something when you can earn your parents' respect. Yes. Not everybody has an easy response from their parents when they make this kind of a decision. Uh, Sister Emina, what kind of response did you get? Well, um, I've been Muslim for seven years, and I've been covering from the beginning. And I went through a real rough time with my mother. Um, she wouldn't speak to me for more than a year. We didn't speak, not even on the phone or at all. And I finally made myself make contact with her on a regular basis just because I knew it was my obligation to my mother to be kind to her. And, um, you know, I thought that me covering was a big part of the reason why she was so negative toward me and my decision. And then um, I never really could discuss it with her because there was always confrontation whenever we did finally get back together. And uh, so I just avoided the subject. So then, um, during Christmas of this year, she, well, she never, she, she respects me in that I don't celebrate it. And she, always, and I always try to respect that she wants me to be a part of um, the holiday for her. And so I allow her to bring gifts over to my children without actually saying that they are Christmas gifts. And so while she was leaving, she gave me a letter. And um, after she had left, I read it. And in the letter, she told me how proud she was of me and that I was, um, that whenever I was younger, she thought that I would be the one of her children to be most successful. And then uh, she had changed her mind after I became Muslim. But now, she, again, she thinks that I am that one. And she was very proud of me for being who I am and sticking with what I believe. That is very courageous. Sister Jathia has a story to relate to us. I was raised by a Caucasian woman, so it was a... Uh, when she found out that I had converted and, and finally started accepting and practicing, um, she would always cry whenever she would talk to me or be real sad. And It took her a while to tell me why. Someone had told her that Islam was a black thing. And by me converting, that she could no longer be in my life. So we... we explained and said, no, this is not true, it doesn't matter, you're, you're my mother, I have to have respect for you. That is what Islam is teaching, to have respect. So that's, alhamdulillah, now that she's, she's aware and she knows, she doesn't feel that way. And she still never to this day told me who told her that, I guess. Sister Latifa. Okay, when I accepted the religion, my dad had, was deceased, but my mom was alive. And 
she's a pretty well-off woman and she told me that I could not be a part of her will unless I denounced my religion. So I told her I really appreciate that and just denounce me. That would be fine. It wouldn't be a problem at all. So some probably two or three years later we sat down and we talked and she felt that everything she had taught me I had gone against it and I assured her that what she taught me was a great reason for my going towards the way of life and I really appreciated her for you know teaching me and instilling the values in me that she did even as a Christian and just from that conversation since then I'm, she has accepted me wholeheartedly she respects me a hundred percent and I really appreciate it but I have never disrespected her in any of the questions she asked me or any of the things she said to me because I knew she didn't understand my way of life that's the reason why she was being the way she was so I think by me being positive she was really trying to test me to see if I really believed as I said I did and once she found out that I was consistent in my belief and in my way of life she didn't have any reasons to reject me I'll tell my story next before I hand the microphone off to Tracy my parents were very understanding they gave me support all along the way they were so interested that they indeed started doing some research on their own they finally decided it was not for them but you know more power to me if I would do it what surprised me was that my brothers and sisters who had always been so close to me weren't as accepting that they had to come to their own conclusions and when they all came to my house uh, one December and I say I can't say for Christmas because in my family there's a Buddhist and a Hindu and I mean a, sorry, a Buddhist and a Catholic and we're, we're very much and Jew so we're very much mixed crowd um, one of my brothers was very upset that the women went to the kitchen family room area and the men went to the living room area and this upset him so much he said I won't be back five years later now he's very curious about Islam he may not ever become a Muslim and that's okay but the fact that now he understands why the women naturally gravitated towards the kitchen and why the men automatically went to the living room made him more comfortable and now he's much more tolerant and so at last after many years we in some ways she's accepting it I'm going to open the floor now for more general comments Sarah I think has something that she wants to share with us I just wanted to add something about our families I personally I had a hard time in the beginning and they got over it and I lived away from home for a while and I moved out I moved back right before I I got married and and they got over it but I think the key to families accepting it is that we are constant and consistent in our practices and that we are still loving towards them the way the Quran teaches us to be. It says in the Quran that when we are, when we like say, uh, to our mom, that it shakes the throne of God. It's such a big sin. And I think that as Muslim women, especially women since we are the mothers, being kind to our own mothers is important as an example to our children and as an example to our, our ancestors, to our families. And that's the key, I think. If you listen to all the stories, the ones that have finally accepted it, it's because they were consistent. And it takes time. Sometimes, you know, I know of women who, whose families wouldn't speak to them for maybe five years, six years. But they came around. They all came around if they were truly loving families to begin with. And that's the key, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sahar has some general comment for us. And others, please think of comments that you'd like to make. Well, I wanted to say that um, people around here have always viewed wearing hijab as something that women are when they're oppressed and they're not as strong as the men. It's just showing that Islam is something when women have no power. But I had the ch we all have the choice here to do hijab. And even though I was a Muslim, I never did it till just this last November. And people in my school saw that fact that it was it was showed everybody always I've always been someone just I've never had my own opinion but I never really always made other people believe you know it was never headstrong and when I did hijab people realized that my belief was so strong 
to me it was so important the fact that I would do hijab and it showed the exact opposite of what people believe about hijab it shows how strong you are even in this community where nobody in my school does hijab I'm still willing to and I'm not oppressed it's because I want to um, I think at this time sister Jamila has a comment for us uh, when I first became Muslim, the person who had the most difficult time with my becoming Muslim and my decision to cover since the day of Shahada was my mother. Um, she comes from a very conservative, you know, Christian family missionary. And this was really hard on her because she always expected me to be the one to marry the minister to, you know, do something for the church, you know, because it was really important to me, God. And when I became a Muslim, it just kind of shattered all her, I guess, dreams for me. And she took it really hard. I mean, first thing she said after she, you know, found out, she called and she cried and she gave me a hard time. And then I couldn't talk to her. I tried to call. She would hang up. I would go to visit my parents. I was living in the dormitory at the time. I would go to visit them, and she would leave. And uh, my father would come visit me. He's, mashallah, very kind, very kind man. And I was concerned about my mother because in Islam, the mother is so important. And so I wrote her a letter telling her of what I remembered about her what I appreciated about her and you know I told her I appreciate this and this and this and I understand this and why you did this I didn't like it then but I understand that and I said and these are the things that you taught me and I'm living up to the morals that you taught me something my father had said is you know if you have the right religion you can study everything else and if you're honest you'll keep the right religion but if you don't have the right religion if you find it you're honest you're going to change otherwise you can't live a lie and I said it's you know it's what you and dad taught me that makes me a Muslim. It's the morals and the the guidance that makes me the inshallah good person that I am. I try to be. <laughs> Only God knows, you know, who's better than who. And uh, I wrote this letter and I told her, you know, I loved her very much and I said my decision to be Muslim and my decision to be hijab is not personal against you. It is personal between me and God. And I have to put God first, but definitely you come second. And I love you very much. And she wrote me back a letter, a beautiful letter. I still have it. And she told me that she appreciated my letter. And she hadn't talked to me since I became a Muslim. She wrote me back. She told me she appreciated my letter. And she told me remembrances that she had, that she you know, enjoys remembering about me. And she told me that she loved me and that she would always be my mother and that meant a lot to me and since then we have talked and basically she kind of got over the hard part of the religion she then she asked me so what idol do you worship and I said well we don't worship idols and she started to ask me what is it you believe and now basically I think the only difficulty is she's still very closely tied to Jesus is God and and she doesn't like hijab <laughs> she's scared for me it's not that she hates it she's scared for me she thinks I'm going to be a target for anyone who's crazy out there and I said mother this is a risk I'm willing to take if I get killed because I'm wearing hijab good because where do I get to go if they kill me because I'm being a good Muslim this is this is a privilege I said my wearing hijab is a right I have. I'm an American and I have freedom. I have freedom to choose the way I want to dress, to choose the way I want to believe, and religion I want to follow, and I'm not hurting anybody else. You know, I'm not hurting anyone. In fact, I want to help anyone I can. If I can, I will. And this is what Islam teaches. Sister Jamila, I'm going to cut in. And because I saw so many heads nod at one point when you were talking about the risks involved 
in being a Muslim, especially one easily seen? Are we targets? I feel like we are because they see so much on television about Muslims and how they're supposed to be so bad. They believe what is on television instead of talking to the Muslim that's here and finding out more about the religion and the kind of person they are. They assume that all people are alike. Do you feel your life is in jeopardy in our town? I have a show of hands. There so we times can, where I did feel So we like have that. almost half, maybe half? There, there are times when I did feel like that, like with uh, Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. I was driving down the street and some, me and Holland, go back to Iraq. You know, what a few other words. <laughs> and, you know, I just kind of smiled and turned the corner real fast. Mm -hmm. But I say, I like to send my compliments out, out to all the sisters that do cover. My son was answering the phone, but for a soccer game. <laughs> you can just disconnect it from the wall. I don't mind it all. <laughs> well, I feel this way. Okay. Um, alhamdulillah, just living in America is, uh, you're at risk for a lot of things. You, we probably have just as much chance as being shot in a drive-by shooting or or someone going berserk in a, a department store for any reason other than being a Muslim. So um, it's, a, it's not really a fear it's that I have. I don't have a fear of it. I, I feel as though my relationship with Allah is close enough that I really believe that no one's going to do anything to me that Allah wouldn't allow. So if they do it, Allah allowed and alhamdulillah, subhanAllah. Sister Savoya, please go ahead. Uh, yes. During the time of Desert Storm you were talking about, me and my husband were assaulted at our doorstep uh, for absolutely no reason at all. My husband was beat down by a couple of guys, and I was screaming, and it was awful. But, you know, since then we've lived normal, average lives. We, we know that this is something that just happens, and hopefully it won't happen again. But um, that is one of my biggest fears. Did um, you feel that it was because you were, yes, you were yes. obviously a target? Yes. Um, one of my biggest fears is that uh, one day we will have to face uh, oppressors, I think because of Islam growing, and people not so much as seeing Islam as being wrong, but they don't even want to come to terms with practicing their own religion. So I think it's just the fact that they're afraid of living right. They want to keep doing things the way that man wants to do it and not the way that God wants to do it. Sister Sarah has a comment for us. I think also it has to do with how active we as Muslim are in explaining to people who aren't Muslim what our religion is really about. Um, I was in Connecticut during the, the Gulf War. And there we did a lot of protests and we were always visible and we were always on the street and we were always passing out information in Spanish and English about what Islam was truly about and what we thought about this war and why we thought it. And I know that because my, my husband's family, because we were originally from Tulsa, you know, listening to them and, and, and hearing the things that were going on in Tulsa and um, you know, just the different things that were going on around the country, um, that it seemed to me that the communities, that the, the, the women weren't standing out in society and, and, and doing things in the society, uh, that those were the communities that had more problems in dealing with non-Muslims there because they didn't understand it. And then you go back to just, you know, basic racial discrimination. They don't understand anything about a religion or a people and they're going to be scared of it. And what you're scared of, you keep down. And that had a lot to do with the reason why I went back to school and why I got more active in, in propagating Islam and why I live my life so out in public now as I do. Because now I, I feel that the people that see me all around are more comfortable with being around a woman who's actually in hijab. They're, they're tolerant of it because they see it. They're used to it. 
and what you're used to, you're really not afraid of. So that's all I have to say. And I, I, I want to say one more thing. Of this group, there's several women who are working and going to school and getting their education. And I think that Islam, Islam for us is, is much, much easier now and much more productive. I mean, Sarah said that. Um, I go to the university and I've had people, you know, at first they would say, you know, they would be like, not talk to me. They would be kind of like, you know, standoffish a little bit. And then after they start talking to me, they'll say, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're just common. You're, you know, ordinary. So I think it's important for us to, to get out, you know, and to be friendly with people. Don't, uh, don't sit back and not talk to people. You know, because then they'll start asking you more about your religion. They'll start asking you. and So just give people a smile, you know, and they'll think, well, you are nice. You know, and it'll spread the Islam around, I think, more. And I would like to say also about uh, the question was what keeps us uh, with Islam. You know, the fear of Allah, of course, and wanting to get into heaven. But I think also what keeps us strong is uh, our daily prayers and the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is the most beautiful thing, you know, we're fasting and I think the best thing is when we go to the masjid, if we stay and pray the prayer, you know, you just feel the closeness in the community. I was going to say, I don't know about how the other sisters feel, but whenever I go out in the community, I feel like a bull in a china shop. I just feel so very powerful and being covered in, in, in jilbab or, you know, um, correct Islamic dress. I feel that I can do anything, go anywhere, and I just have the power there. And that's all I, uh, that's where my strength com comes from. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, Sister Sadia has a comment for us. Well, I just think that, inshallah, more and more ladies will start doing hijab like us and we'll become more and more together and that will bring unity and it will show that we are strong and hijab does make you feel very strong and it is no reason to back down on anything. I mean, I, I volunteer at a hospital and I heard a lot of sad stories about women that had to uh, stop doing their jobs over there because they of their hijab, but uh, at that time I, I didn't do hijab and when I started doing it I, was, I went up to the, um, the director and told her that I'm going to be starting to do this and uh, it will not affect my behavior in any way and I won't be preaching to the children <laughs> because I work in the pediatrics depart department and she was very understanding and the very uh, a very inspiring thought that she gave to me was she said that God will really reward you and I was very shocked to hear that from a Christian lady and I work at a hospital that's very at St. Francis and I was really <laughs> Catholic and so I was very surprised and that really gave me much more strength and I think that all of us can go out there there's no reason to back out <laughs> You know, we've been talking a little bit about some of the things that we do as we go out into the community to make life easier for those of us who wear hijab and, and educate other people. And I know that as I look around, I recognize faces of people who've been involved in interfaith activities. Two of you in the teenage trilogues with the Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Others who are doing the work at the universities, um, helping prepare um, lectures and, and bringing guest speakers. And we have adult um, trilogues also. Um, at the community level and also on a monthly basis and these have really helped all of us and sometimes you may not realize some of the ways um, that it's helped put out brush fires before they got to be too big but we can only encourage other people to do these uh, one of the groups that that this group came out of is we started with American wives the American wives were the American wives of foreign-born Muslim men they did not have to be Muslim to join the group and it's a very casual activity but throughout these we started talking about the things that were important to us, those things that we gave up, and those things that we enjoy even more now. And for the women who were not Muslim, they got to ask the questions that were bugging them. Why does my husband do this? Do I have to do that? Do my children, what are they expected to do? And this was a real good opportunity for us. So you can see that in a small town like Tulsa, we have 50 women always on the list, and other cities probably would go into the hundreds or more. Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor, though, to other comments so that we can close the program. Any other comments? Go ahead first. 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, I started on my hijab three years ago at um, Peace Elementary School, the Islamic school here in Tulsa. Um, I probably would have never, I started going to a Christian school or a public school for, from kindergarten until I got to third grade and then I started going to the summer school. Um, if I hadn't had gone to, um, this is summer school, I would have never worn my hijab. And um, I just, I'm, I'm afraid to go to a public school now. Um, but um, even if I have to, I'll always wear my scarf. And right now, we're everywhere. Tell them your point. <laughs> the comment I'd like to make is, <clears throat> um, being of one of the Muslims who covered and then stopped covering and shalom covering all the time now. Um, there's lots of Muslims that are like me, are scared to cover because of what the community, especially ones that have lived around the community they are living for a long time, they're scared what their friends are going to think, they don't want to explain it. But in Islam, the stronger you get, you have to stick with it. And if everybody hangs together, if all the Muslims that don't cover now cover and I mean, it's going to make it a bigger community. There are so many Muslims that we don't even have any idea about that are scared just like all of us were at one time about covering. And this. So if we all stick together as Muslims and cover and encourage each other, you know, and don't get away from each other ever. So just stick together. That's all. <laughs> Denise. I'd like to make a comment about uh, Islam and what people perceive it to be. And Islam is, you know, a beautiful religion. And for a lot of our viewers, they're not familiar with what Islam teaches. But I would like to recommend that they look into it even as a point of information, as I did when I became a Muslim. I had no intention of becoming a Muslim, but Alhamdulillah, I did. But my point is that Islam is a comprehensive religion that teaches people how to deal with their family life, their daily life, all aspects of their life. And uh, something that comes to my mind when I speak with people of other faiths and they, they think that Islam is not the right religion, one response I give them is, even if after all of this life, there is no afterlife, astaghfirullahaladzim, because I do believe that there is an afterlife, but say that there wasn't. If I lived my life in accordance with Islam, then what would I be, what would be the worst, how do I want to say this? Yeah, what would I have lost or what would I have sacrificed by living my life in accordance with Islam? I would not have lost anything because Islam is a good, you know, way of life and it's a very healthy way of life. Uh, teaches people, you know, not to commit adultery, not to have extramarital affairs, not to, um, you know, abuse their children, not to abuse alcohol or drugs. Islam is so comprehensive in all the aspects that it teaches us that I feel that even if there was no afterlife, that my life would be bettered by living in accordance to Islam. That was wonderful. Thank you. I have one comment on, on hijab. Um, I hadn't mentioned before, but we but you had mentioned to us though that hijab is meant as a protection to us and it's not just a protection from outside I mean f for me I use it as a weapon against myself but actually a weapon on my own behalf it helps me make the decisions that would be difficult for me otherwise there are things that I know are popular to do but when I have my scarf on I would think twice I wouldn't go out without it so if I'm going to keep my scarf on all the time that means that I'm not always going to do what's popular because it wouldn't be good for me. I'm a Muslim and this isn't something good for me. In what I eat, in where I go, and what I do. It makes me think twice. When I tell somebody I'm going to do something, it reminds me that other people are counting on me as a Muslim to keep my word. It doesn't make me perfect. It probably makes me even less than perfect than I tried to be before, but now I'm trying so much harder because I'm striving in the way of God. Always pushing harder, harder. Sister Jamila had to comment to me. 
I just wanted to say that uh, in Islam, for every question, there is an answer. You're never left ignorant and blame it on lack of faith, because faith is belief in the unknown. And who, has, who here has seen God? But we know he's there. And uh, considering the hijab, the difference before and after wearing hijab in the jilbab, uh, is is uh, tremendous. I'm not saying that you know you were target practice before and target practice after, even though it could be circ different circumstances, considering what you look like. But uh, like the sister said, you know it's a protection. You get respect uh, overall. I mean, there are some people who will uh, give you a hard time. And basically, it's because they don't understand. I like my mother's definition of prejudice as being down on something you're not up on. People who get down on you because of the way you dress or because of the way you believe is because they don't know you. They don't understand you. And what we need to do is be proud of ourselves, continue living and believing and, and following what we believe, and be polite and very kindly educate them. Sister Samaya. And I want to say that no one here is saying that women who don't wear hijab are bad or unmodest because there are a lot of modest women who do not wear hijab, but they have clean hearts. But to wear hijab is better for you and more protection. Are there any other comments? I'd just like to say that it's also an outward sign of an inward change in you. When you wear the hijab, it is a test. It is hard for you at times when you're out in the public eye, but it also comes with responsibility, as the other sisters have pointed out, in being polite to your fellow man, I mean Christians and Jews alike. We cannot tell them in a crowd what they are, Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or whatever religion they are. A lot of times we cannot tell what they are. And our Muslim men in the community should also be supportive of our women because they tend to blend into the crowd where we stand out. And it's important that, you know, women understand that this is a responsibility on them because basically we are the face of Islam in America. And people interpret Islam by our behavior. And I'm not saying that it's always easy, but I encourage all the sisters to put on their best face, look the best that they can when they go out. It's easy to put on a wrinkled scarf, a wrinkled jilbab, and run to the store, but stop to think about how many times, you know, people are going to be looking at you and what impression they're going to be taking. Try to always put your best face forward as you would when you didn't cover and you wanted to look your best. Sister Patricia. there that when you see us on the street just keep in mind that we all we have feelings and we're just like you uh, my daughter when she was little she wrote a poem she was just three years old um, she was in the third grade in the public school she wrote I'm a person just like you it was uh, I'm a person just like you I'm no different I'm not new I'm a person just like you so I would just like for you to keep that in mind that we are just like you we have feelings thanks Brother Hamid, we finished all of our lists. We just need the, the names of everybody, your name, and uh, the description of your soul. Just kind of quick. Excuse me while I can't cross the road. Your name and something about you. What kind of description? Yeah. Raised in a Muslim family. Uh, at what time did you convert? Yeah. Okay. Where you go to school? What your major is? What your field is? Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Sahar Jaliwala, and I was a born Muslim, not a convert. And I'm a senior in high school. And that's all. <laughs> okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Paula Alia. Um, I've been Muslim for almost six years, and I converted when I married my husband on the day I married my husband. And I have two children, girls. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sara Asad. And I converted before I got married, and I've been married about six years. I've been Muslim seven and something. And I go to TJC, Tulsa Junior College, and I'm majoring in computer science. And that's my mother-in-law. <laughs> <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. I'm Barbara Malikadeen, 
and I took shahada over 20 years ago and been in and out of <laughs> hijab for a few years. I'm back and alhamdulillah, I'm loving. And I, subhanallah. <laughs> uh, what's your field? Oh, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse longer than I've been a Muslim. <laughs> My name is Sadia Ali, and I am a natural born Muslim, and I, I'm going to college, and I plan to pursue uh, some kind of career in medicine, inshallah. My name is Salima Jalaluddin. I am a converted Muslim 10 years as of today. Um, I become Muslim before I was married. I'm a mother and housewife. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Amina Swar. Uh, I go to Tulsa Junior College. My major is education. I've been Muslim for seven years, and I have three small children. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Denise Mugurabi. I'm a mother of four children. I've been Muslim for 12 years, a little over that actually, and uh, my major is criminal justice. Uh, hello, my name is Barbara, better known as Sumeya Al Sharif. And I have been a Muslim for 10 years, uh, long before I was married to a Muslim. And I have a degree in psychology, and now my major is in nursing. And I have three children, mashallah. Salaam alaikum. My name's Olivia, and I converted to Islam last Ramadan, and still a Muslim now. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kim Malad. I go to Peace Elementary School. Um, I'm in second grade, S sixth grade. Assalamu <coughs> alaikum. My name is Zainab Al Musawi. I am the secretary of Peace Elementary School. Alhamdulillah, I have a wonderful job there. And I have a son who's 11 and a half years old, and I've been a Muslim for about seven years now. I was married for 10 years before I even became a Muslim, so. I wasn't forced into it. I just thought I'd let everybody know. <laughs> Salaam alaikum. My name is Tracy Gazaway, and I've been a Muslim going on four years. Uh, I'm currently teaching at uh, Peace Elementary School. And My name is Patricia Rose. My married name is Milad. I um, was married in 1979. I didn't become Muslim until 1987. I have four children. I work at Peace Elementary, and uh, I'm work I have associates in liberal arts. Now I'm working on my early childhood at NSU, and that's it. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Amelia in the Sellers, better known as Jamila Saifo. Um, I've been a Muslim for seven, eight years. I've been married uh, four or five years. <laughs> uh, found out about my husband for the first time about a year before we got married, so he had nothing to do with it. Uh, this was a very personal decision. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Behavioral Science, International Dimensions, and I'm going for certification in elementary education. And I have one wonderful son I love dearly. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Latifa Kareem. I'm a mother of nine children. And my major is fashion design and pattern making. I'm a member of the Tulsa Metropolitan Ministries Board. My name is Cheryl Siddiqui. I retired from emergency room nursing many years ago. And since being in charge of emergency rooms, I've taken on working for school boards, uh, both religious and non-religious. Um, I have three boys. We're just getting to the teenage years and seeing what a thrill it is, and uh, that tends to keep me busy. Assalamu alaikum. I am Safa Ghazali. I am 12 years old. I'm going to be 13 in, on June 15th. Um, I go to Central Junior High in Lawrence, Kansas, and my dad is the Imam of Lawrence, Kansas, and he's the Vice President of ISNA, and I've got two sisters and two brothers. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Jatia Kareem. I have three children. <laughs> 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 
Assalamu alaikum, my name is Khalida Fatiha and I'm in fourth grade and I love Islam. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Rashida Fatiha. I go to Peace Elementary, I'm 12 years old, and my best friends are Kiyam Wamida, Jamila Abdullah, and Hayat Sa'adun. And I like reading. Well, I'd like to thank all uh, the sisters over here for the uh, participation in this program and uh, I ask God to reward them for their time and participation and hopefully we'll uh, see this program sometimes aired in uh, Tulsa here in the, before the year ends inshallah. Also we're planning to air it in uh, Dallas and uh, maybe in Washington DC and hopefully in Saudi Arabia and Malaysia if we can do that inshallah. Thank you very much. and. Uh, God bless you for all the help you did for us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.